What's going on guys? Welcome back. And today I'm going to be bringing you a project that I've been working on for quite a while, and that is my ranking of every single new release I saw in 2021. Yes, you heard me correctly. That is including movies and TV shows. Some of you may feel that is an unfair comparison because shows have more time to tell a story than movies do, but this year in particular I feel a lot of Marvel shows and just shows in general tried to follow a film structure, so I feel it's not as unfair a comparison as some of you might think. I know there are some some new releases that are just kind of starting at the end of 2021 right now, such as The Book of Boba Fett and Cobra Kai Season 4, but I don't have time to watch the entirety of Cobra Kai Season 4 in one day, and The Book of Boba Fett only has one episode right now, so I can't accurately judge the show based on that. So I'll be including those in the 2022 ranking, I don't really count them as 2021 releases. Now I feel this goes without saying, but this is obviously an opinion-based ranking. Some of the things at the top of my list may be at the bottom of your list, and some of the things at the bottom of my list may be at the top of your list that's just the great thing about differing opinions please do not feel like any of my opinions are a personal attack on you if you have a different placement please feel free to share your own opinions in the comments below and while there were a lot of things that I was looking forward to about making this video there was one thing in particular that I was really not looking forward to and it was having to talk about WandaVision again now some of you may know if you've been following the channel all year that I have a complicated history with this show, to say the least. In fact, I disliked it so much that I could make four videos ripping it apart. Oh wait, I already did that. So I'm going to keep this brief, but the only reason I watched this show was because it was the first Marvel thing to come out in over a year. I thought maybe they'd fix some of their problems that they've been criticized for in the past, but they didn't. This show does the same thing that Marvel always does. They rip a concept from a different genre, in this case sitcoms, and act like they're doing something unique and different while really not doing that at all. It all arrives at the same bland conclusion as every other Marvel thing with a shooty shoot punch punch lasers bad CGI finale and the villains are possibly the worst in the entire franchise. They're written to be overly evil because Marvel feels like they can't tarnish their perfect protagonist who actually isn't a good person in the slightest and tortures a bunch of people and gets away with it at the end of the show without owning up to their actions. It's just an awful show. I really don't like anything about it, and this is the last time I will ever talk about it on this channel. Then moving on to number 18, I have Zack Snyder's Justice League. When I saw this movie earlier in the year, I said I thought it was okay, but it's just more of what I don't like about comic book movies. I still stand by that, but looking back on it now, I actually think it's a really bad movie. It's so overly long and dragged out, it uses way too much CGI. Nothing in this movie is created practically. Everything is fake, which completely pulls me out of it because there's nothing to latch onto. It repeats the same plot we have seen ten times over with the villains trying to collect some items and the heroes have to stop them, except for the fact that the cast of this movie is far less likable than in the Avengers movies, which I don't even like. But Zack Snyder writes all of these characters to be these personalityless caricatures who I don't care about at all. He doesn't give any of them arcs whatsoever. And it also just feels completely pointless because the majority of the movie feels like setup for something that we know will never happen because WB is trying to completely erase everything Zack Snyder ever did within the DCEU. Everything about this movie just doesn't appeal to me. I know a lot of people love this movie, and if you love it, that's fine. I don't have anything against you for that, but I just don't care at all about this movie, and I actually, like, forgot it existed before I made this video. Now, moving on to number 17, I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this. I have Spider-Man No Way Home. I'm gonna keep this very brief because I'm planning on making an entire video breaking down this movie. But I really didn't like it, and that really sucks, because I love Spider-Man. He's my favorite fictional character of all time, but particularly as a fan of the older Spider-Man movies, I felt like all the returning characters were done a complete disservice by the writing, which seemed to view them as nothing more than MCU parody versions rather than the actual characters they were in their films. The story is so full of plot holes, but people seem to give that a pass because they cover it up with lame fan service. And they try to tell this mature story about the troubles of Peter Parker's life, but I could not get invested in this movie. I felt nothing because of how badly written it was. The only reason it gets any points from me is because I felt like Tom Holland was trying so hard and he was pouring his heart and soul into this movie that no one actually cared about making, and that sucks. 
When a movie requires me to turn my brain off to the extent that this movie did, I can't even get any ironic enjoyment out of it. At number 16, I have Venom Let There Be Carnage. Now, this movie is awful if held under any level of scrutiny, and despite the fact that it is easily worse than everything below it on this list, I still get more ironic enjoyment out of it. It is so incompetent on every level that it's hilarious. There is no character development. It is terribly edited, and it serves no point because of the fact that what is set up in the post credit scene of this film is not even paid off in Spider-Man Far From Home. While this movie is not good on any level, I still find it so entertaining. At number 15, I have LEGO Star Wars Terrifying Tales. Now, some of you may not even count this as a movie, but I'm including the new Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie on this list, and it's 60 minutes, this is only 45, and it's my list, I can do whatever I want. I thought this was a perfectly entertaining piece of LEGO Star Wars media. If you've seen the past LEGO Star Wars specials, you know what you're getting into. It relies a lot on reference humor, but I found it perfectly entertaining and watchable. It was cool that they were able to give Poe Dameron a character arc, which the Star Wars sequels were unable to do over their three movie length. Now, moving on to number 14, I have Monsters at Work, the Monsters Inc. spinoff show that released in the summer. You may remember I made a video on it when we only had three or four episodes out, and based on its placement on this list, you may be able to tell that I didn't love it by the end. Now, I found this show perfectly watchable and somewhat entertaining. I never hated the experience of watching it, but it uses so many common predictable tropes from children's entertainment that just didn't make a lot of sense in context. For example, in one of the episodes, the protagonist does something which kind of excludes his friends, but the only reason he does that is because his friends lied to him about their actual skill set related to this task that he was asking them to do. So he decides to do something that any of us would do, but then they try to have the cliche where his friends show up and go, oh man, that was so mean and inconsiderate of you to exclude us, but we actually lied to you, so it's perfectly justified for you to do that. It does that a lot and it doesn't make a lot of sense. It also contains a lot of reoccurring gags or jokes, which just become kind of predictable. For example, the demolition expert of the group from MIFT constantly has this gag where she's talking about people who died in the workplace, and it starts off being kind of funny, but then it happens in every episode and it becomes really predictable. It also contains some pretty irritating characters such as Duncan, who's such an annoying little asshole, and they give him an episode where it seems like he grows as a character and decides to stop being an annoying asshole. But in the next episode, he just reverts back to his usual manner, and it's so annoying. It also feels kind of dragged out, like it's ten episodes long, and I enjoyed the first couple and the last few, but a lot of the middle episodes feel unnecessary, it just feels kind of dragged out, and it's not really fun to watch, like, in one sitting. It kind of becomes boring, because a lot of the episodes start to meld together in my brain, and they become predictable, as I said. So while this show was not awful, and I never really hated the experience of watching it, it also failed to be something truly good or memorable. At number 13, I have Diary of a Wimpy Kid, the almost TV special length movie that was released on Disney+. Plus. Now, I really don't have a lot to say about this movie. I made a review on it. I found it perfectly watchable and entertaining. It's nothing super special. It's a fine adaptation of that original story, while not having as much substance as the live action films, which I think is fine because we still have those films. Greg is slightly less unlikable than he is in those films though which based on your preference could be a better or worse thing it was just fine it was a perfectly watchable movie there's nothing super special about it but there's nothing particularly bad about it either at number 12, I have Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. When this movie came out, I said that I actually liked it a decent amount, and I still stand by that to some extent. It's a perfectly watchable movie and is certainly one of the better MCU films. The origin for Shang-Chi does feel somewhat unique and different from other Marvel origin stories, but it still is restricted by so many of the common Marvel issues, such as the bad forced humor at inappropriate moments. There's literally a scene where Shang-Chi is talking about his tragic past and how he was forced to kill somebody, and it gets cut off by a beef joke that goes on for like two minutes. I'm not kidding. And the forced CGI battle at the end. 
The conflict for most of the movie is a personal one between father and son, but towards the end of the movie it devolves into an ugly shooty shoot punch punch lasers finale with no emotional core and it just lost me. And despite the fact that it does kind of try to delve into a different culture and talks about different themes than other Marvel movies, something about it just feels Marvelized. And that keeps me from becoming fully invested in it. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. At number 11, I have Hawkeye. Now, this one and the one below it are basically on the same level for me, but I think I enjoyed this one just slightly more. I liked it towards the beginning, but by the end, it felt so overstuffed with characters and plot lines to the point of insanity, and suffered from so many plot holes and contrivances that it pulled me out. The title character, Hawkeye himself, also has little to no development over the course of the story, and the one plot thread he has running throughout it felt like an afterthought. Despite that, Haley Steinfeld really did carry the show for me and has the best character arc. That may just be me being biased because I'm a huge fan of hers, but I thought she did a great job playing the character of Kate Bishop. The action scenes were also solid and felt grounded and somewhat realistic without overusing CGI to the point of insanity. The character interactions were also great, and whenever Haley Steinfeld and Jeremy Renner were simply having a conversation, I was gripped. Despite that, though, the show felt so overstuffed and set up y to the point where it didn't know where its general focus should be. At number 10, I have Cobra Kai Season 3, which released like on January 1st this year, and I have not talked about Cobra Kai on this channel really at all. I made a minifigure showcase on it, but I never made an actual video on the show itself. And my friend introduced it to me, and I think it's a really solid show, and this season is still pretty decent. It's very entertaining and well made for how low the budget is, and the action scenes are really well shot and choreographed. The character writing is also mostly solid and feels realistic in the sense that a lot of characters make irritating decisions, but in a realistic way. Despite that, this season was the weakest so far, in my opinion. It starts to repeat character arcs. For example, Robbie starts off a bad kid who becomes a good kid, but he's now irritating again. And his actions are so irritating, but not in the way that they are intelligently written. It feels instead like the screenwriters are running out of ideas for what to do with his character. And it also starts to become so over the top to the point where it loses any sense of realism. Don't get me wrong, the show has always been somewhat over the top and corny in an intentional way, but once you have the Cobra Kai students breaking into the LaRusso household and committing property damage, as well as John Kreese attempting murder, it starts to lose any sense of realism. Like, okay, someone would have seen that, called the cops, and John Kreese is going to jail, the conflict of the show is over, it's done. Earlier seasons felt kind of over the top and corny, but at the end of season two, things started to get real with Miguel breaking his back. But now they're treating these elements that should feel kind of dark and real, like John Kreese attempting murder, and they're just kind of playing it off as though it's something unimportant, while earlier in the show, serious events were treated with realism. And that's where the show just starts to feel inconsistent to me, and I'm very skeptical about season four. Now moving on to number nine, I have Star Wars Visions, the Star Wars anime series that released on Disney Plus a couple months ago, and this show proved to me that Star Wars is willing and capable of adopting a different culture and storytelling style without forcing in their common tropes and cliches like Marvel did with Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi was a story about a different culture and should have felt different, but it felt marvelized. This show did not feel Star Wars eyes. It felt so detached from the common Star Wars storytelling style to the point where while I was watching certain episodes, I didn't even feel like I was watching something Star Wars, which I think was really cool. It's difficult to rank for me though, because I'm not a big anime person. Despite that, I did really enjoy it. But all of the episodes are non-linear. They are their own self-contained shorts, basically. And there were some that I enjoyed more than others, and some that I didn't like quite as much. It's one that I certainly respect and admire, perhaps more than I personally enjoy it. At number 8, I have Doug Days, the series of short films based on Pixar's Up that released on Disney+. Plus. This series is just entertainment in its simplest and purest form. That's the best word I can use to describe this series of shorts. They're just pure. They're the perfect length, 5-10 minute shorts that you can really watch in just an hour. 
and it touches on themes and messages that are universal and can appeal to anyone. Even if you're not a fan of Pixar's Up, if you're just a person that likes dogs, you'll enjoy these shorts. They don't do anything particularly spectacular, but they also don't do anything wrong. They're just perfect. They're just great, fun, watchable pieces of entertainment that are heartwarming and entertaining, and I couldn't really ask for anything more from them. At number seven, I have No Time to Die, the final film in Daniel Craig's James Bond series, and this film provides an excellent conclusion to Daniel Craig's James Bond's story, and is just really well made on a technical level. The action is mostly created practically with minimal CGI, and I thought it was very impressive, and it surprisingly feels deserving of its length, which is 2 hours and 45 minutes. It never felt too long, I was constantly engaged in the story, and I was surprisingly moved by the end of it. It has some corny elements, but are not so intrusive to me to the point where they ruin the overall experience. The only reason it's not higher is because I didn't grow up with James Bond, I'm not a huge James Bond fan, but I cannot deny that this film is really well made on every level. At number six, I have Don't Look Up, the film starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence that released on Netflix a few days ago. I just watched it last night, and I know it has sparked a lot of controversy, but I felt like this film did convey an important message while also being extremely funny. It talks about how corrupt people in power really are and how reluctant we as a society are to respond to real legitimate issues before it's too late. You see throughout the film this group of scientists trying to convince the government that there is no way to stop this asteroid and that we are all going to die. But the government doesn't listen, and they spread fake news through social media to try and cover up for how corrupt they really are. And I felt like the film just did convey very important social commentary while also being extremely funny and never tonally inconsistent. The movie made me feel when it wanted me to feel, and it made me laugh when it wanted me to laugh. I just thought it was a really well-made movie, and I would recommend it to any of you who have not seen it yet. At number five, I have Luca, the most recent Pixar film. And this film has been hated on a lot, and it's also been praised. For me, it has a lot of themes of belonging and kind of trying to find a purpose in the world that really did resonate with me, and it is a simple yet effective story. It's not one of Pixar's deepest films, but despite that, it manages to connect with me better than some previous films of theirs. I would say this film actually connected with me more than Soul did, and it's the first time I've actually teared up while watching a movie in quite a while, and I just found this movie to be something really special. It's more important to me than I feel it is truly a great film, but this is my personal opinion, so Luca comes in at number five. At number four, I have Worth, the film starring Michael Keaton as an attorney following the events of the September 11th attack as he basically attempts to calculate the value of each person's lives in a respectful way to their families. And I thought this film was a very well-made and emotional story that conveyed with gritty realism the events following 9-11. The acting from everyone was phenomenal, and outside of being a 9-11 movie, it tells a story that I always love of redemption and changing yourself and the world for the better. Michael Keaton's character in this film has to change his worldview in a way, and in the process change this document that he has created, and is able to change things for the better, and I always love stories like that. This film's greatest fault may be its lack of a directorial style, but I feel like that was intentional because it feels more like a documentary than a film. This film has excellent political commentary, but it is very heavy, it deals with heavy subject matter, and it's not a film that I really want to re-watch frequently, but it's still a great film. At number three, I have The Mitchells vs. The Machines, a film that tells a story about family and our connections to one another that I feel can resonate with anyone. It's easily the funniest film I have seen all year, and deals with themes about passion and creativity that greatly resonate with me on a personal level, considering the fact that my goal once I get into university is to go into the field of animation just like the character Katie in this film. 
it's not quite as good, I would say, as Phil Lord and Chris Miller's previous work on movies like The Lego Movie or Spider-Verse, but it's still a fantastic film and probably my favorite movie of the year. At number two, I have Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 1. This show I do not understand the hate for. It worked for me on almost every level. I felt it perfected the Clone Wars art style, the animation in it was beautiful, and it managed to continue the themes of the Clone Wars show in a way that I was not expecting. I originally criticized the show halfway through for not being able to continue the themes of the Clone Wars show of individuality. The Clone Wars show is about individuality and the clones who were all originally identical characters discovering a sense of individuality within themselves. This show is, by definition, about characters who are already individuals. They have individual defining character traits, so thus the show could not be about individuality. But I realized at the end of the show that I was wrong and that it managed to branch off from that theme of individuality by telling a story about purpose. The clone's purpose was to be disposed of by Palpatine in his grand scheme, and in this show we are seeing for the first time a group of clones attempting to discover purpose. On the way, they encounter this young girl, Omega, who they adopt into their clan, and they believe that she is perhaps their new purpose, to protect her. But then, they come into conflict with their brother, Crosshair, who has different ideologies and believes that his purpose is to stay loyal to the system that they have sworn allegiance to, but the rest of them believe that that system may perhaps not be as just as they initially thought. This show also had the opposite issue of WandaVision, where everything by the end of the show felt worth it, and it felt like it was paid off by the finale. Looking back on the show by the finale, I felt like every episode had a purpose. Even episodes that I did not like as much had important messages or themes that they explored, in a way that did not talk down to the audience. I always felt like the show treated its audience with respect, and despite being an animated kids show, quote unquote, it managed to deal with very dark and deep elements without feeling overly childish like Star Wars Rebels did at points to me. It also handled cameos well, unlike I feel a lot of media this year. Every character showing up had a purpose and either progressed the story for the main characters or served a purpose thematically. This show also gave me something to look forward to every week without any sense of skepticism. With every other show this year, especially the Marvel shows, I was always skeptical as to where it was about to go next because I felt like the show couldn't pull it off. This show had so much time to tell its story, and it gave me something to look forward to every week without a sense of skepticism, and it was consistently enjoyable for me. This show's biggest problem, at least thus far, is that it has neglected several characters such as Echo or Tech, they have not gotten a lot of development or growth as characters thus far, but that's what's great about this show is that they are still continuing it. There is a season two coming out and there is always more time to develop characters like that. So far, this show has just worked for me on every level thematically, character-wise, and even just in general, it gave me something to enjoy every week and I can't thank it enough for that. But coming in at number one, my favorite thing to have come out of 2021 was easily The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This is, in my opinion, the closest the MCU has ever come to perfection, and it is my favorite thing to come out of that franchise. It tells a story that feels detached from everything else about the franchise, and thus allows me to become more easily invested in the story. The problem with other MCU projects is that they constantly remind me of films such as Endgame, where they establish that they had a time machine they can use to go back in time with and save people. The problem with Hawkeye is that it's a story about people mourning the loss of Natasha, which I can't really take seriously, unfortunately, because they have this loophole they can use to get around that. But with this show, they don't constantly remind me of the MCU. There aren't any unnecessary references, bad jokes, or character cameos, and the show is just able to explore real-world issues in a smart and intelligent way. It really doesn't suffer from any of the other issues that Marvel commonly suffers from. It's actually colorful, the color grading is actually good, not everything is gray like in the previous Captain America movies in particular. The action scenes are also well done and use their constraints to their advantage in the final episode they set it at night, which allows the imperfections of the CGI to be covered up more than if they were to set it in broad daylight, and the characters actually feel human and understandable with realistic character traits and flaws that allow me to relate to and connect with them on a human level. 
this show was really just made for me. I, I love almost everything about it. It does have its fair share of issues, and it does explore real-world issues in a way similar to The Dark Knight, but it's also just fun to watch. A lot of other movies on this list, such as Don't Look Up or Worth, do discuss real political issues, but this show does it in a way where it's able to get deep and philosophical, but it's also fun to watch, and it's not something where I feel like I won't revisit it. I revisited this show multiple times over the course of the year, and I can see myself revisiting it again in the future. I just love it. It does so much right that I can ignore what it does wrong, and it's easily my favorite thing to come out of 2021. Damn you, Marvel. You made my least favorite and my favorite thing of 2021. Can you be consistent? With all of that said, that is it for my ranking of everything that I saw in 2021. I had a blast making this video and sharing my love of movies and television with you guys. I would say overall that 2021 was a better year for entertainment than 2020, which was almost entirely devoid of it, but nothing this year reached the heights of the best films of 2019 in my opinion. 1917 from 2019 is still one of my favorite films of all time, nothing from this year even comes close to that, but there were some really high highs this year, while well, there were some really low lows that I talked about, there were a lot of really high highs this year, and entertainment as a whole really did kind of make this year a better time for me. I honestly felt like 2020 was a better year for me personally in regards to my life, but 2021 really did give me some escapism with the entertainment that it provided, and I cannot thank Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Bad Batch, Mitchells vs. the Machines, Worth, Luca, and many more for giving me that. But with all that said, you guys, please let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. How would you rank everything that you saw in 2021? Or maybe just give me your top five or ten movies and TV shows that you saw this year. Just whatever your thoughts are, please let me know them all in the comments below. And of course, as always, I hope you guys have a great day. Have a happy new year. Take care.